Thanks very, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks to the Entrepreneurs Network for for welcoming to this uh, to the, today's call. And it's good to see so many people joining to uh, to listen to some innovative ideas on how to support the economic recovery, particularly for SMEs across the UK, which are the backbone of the, of, of the UK's economy and the backbone of our recovery. I'm really keen to hear people's ex experience and particularly how we can continue to the stream of entrepreneurs that, uh, that ensure that businesses can pivot successfully uh, to adapt to the new normal. There's, there's two key things here for me. We've got the new normal now when we have the, uh, when we have the, uh, the situation, social distancing that, uh, that we're getting used to. But there is a new reality that's coming. Some of the permanent and semi-permanent behavior changes uh, that are going to be embedded in our economy. And it's really important that we're ready for that. And we actually uh, the share ideas of how to, how to make sure that we can pivot. And that's a really key word as well. I think furlough is going to be the business word of 2020. I'm really hoping that pivot is going to be the business word of 2021 as people look at the new opportunities and look at the new chances for them to readjust their business models so that we can help all bounce back really successfully. Because SMEs have been particularly acutely uh, affected by the lockdown. 76% of SMEs have seen a reduction of productivity of at least 13%. And it's been obviously an overwhelming decline in sales. 67% of SMEs have made less than 75% of their normal sales. So our plan for the recovery will focus not just on backing business and improving skills, but on creating jobs as well. So we've held five economic recovery roundtables, making sure that we can help small businesses uh, that we can get the increased uh, investment from abroad, but importantly as well that we can have a green recovery because we know that government doesn't create jobs, government doesn't create wealth, you guys do that. It's all the SMEs and businesses throughout the UK. So what we can do is work with you, support all the initiatives and make sure that we can... Uh, uh, help you and work together to, to, to recover strongly. There's been a, a number of conversations that have been accelerated by this, some good, some bad. Uh, but the really good ones are flexible working. We're sitting here meeting on Zoom, uh, which uh, you know, I not worked with um, uh, only three months ago. Um, but so, so digital take up as well is absolutely crucial. And, and we know that for you guys that are members of networks or have a, um, a lot of SMEs, they're your customers, your clients, you speak to them all day, interact with them all day, every day. And so there's some really important um, things that you can do uh, within this as well to highlight the, the, to, the, to those SMEs that you're speaking to that we recognize the importance of rapidly improving uh, utilization and increasing adoption of technologies. Outline as well that... Uh, the digital capabilities are important to help them to return safely and adopt a new ways of operating post-COVID. We will try and supply you with as much support, but uh, you know, I see some of the, 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 the figures on the screen now. You've got a massive reach uh, to, to SMA, so you have a huge role to play in making sure that we can have this two-way conversation. We can get the message that government's out there to support you, uh, build your, your SMEs and improve that digital tech. Um, take up. You have the position to be able to manage and uh, and, uh, and build that digital take up, but we want to reach out to the SMEs themselves to, to, to see what more can be done because it's so, so crucial in improving productivity. So government's investing £56 million to create the Small uh, Business Leadership Programme. We've um, invested uh, £17 million into the Be The Business Initiative. Uh, with the aim to increase firm level productivity. And be the business, it's, again, it's a crucial uh, initiative because, yes, it's uh, government uh, supported, but it's business to business. It's business. SMEs, in my experience and from, from, from my personal experience as well, like that they don't want to hear necessarily from government uh, and how, how government can tell them to run their businesses. They want to hear stories from other business people. People have been there, done that, can bring relevant experience, some really good mentoring skills and advice as well. So that's what we're crucially uh, wanting to do. That coaching, the mentoring and peer improvement networks can help SMEs take a step back, share those experience and explore the solutions collaboratively. And that's so, so important. 
they can gain the confidence then to make better decisions, develop their leadership and management skills through those networks. Small business leaders tend to be tend to have to find the time. They're, 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 they're working for their business. They don't have enough time often to work on their business as well to make sure that they can uh, scan for the future and put these um, practices into place, which is um, going to be ever more important as we reach this, uh, the, we're entering this recovery period. So we've got to share best, best practice and build that resilience. We want to make sure that uh, SMEs have the confidence that we're working closely across government and the private sector to ensure that the right approaches for our recovery are proportionate and coherent, supporting the pipeline of entrepreneurs and ensure the UK is the best place to grow a business and start that business in the first place. And importantly, I don't care where you are in the UK, it should equally be the best place in the world to start and grow their businesses. These are the key priorities of Paige. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was Paul Scully, the Small Business Minister, uh, sharing some words about what the government is currently doing to support small businesses. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And we will uh, we'll come back to you once we've seen some of the policy pictures from today's event. Uh, so, hi everybody, my name is Katrina, I am the coordinator of the APPG for Entrepreneurship. Um, the goal of the APPG is bring together parliamentarians and entrepreneurs uh, to try and foster a supportive environment for entrepreneurs. And that, so it's really great to hear from Paul and all the wonderful things that are happening in government right now. Um, but we can't rest on our laurels because, uh, you know, the future, the future is precarious for all of us. Um, so today is a really great opportunity to look at some of the interesting things that are possibly going to be happening in the near future. Um, I'm going to uh, stop there and lead straight into our first policy pitch. Uh, we're going to be kicking off with Sam Dimitriou, who is the Research Director for the Entrepreneurs Network. Sam, over to you. Hi. Um, yeah, so this is the policy pitch, but I feel listening to what Paul just said, I might be pitching to the choir a bit in terms of uh, some of the ideas um, in, in, a, in our new report today, Upgrade, which looks at digital adoption. So I started researching the link between digital adoption and SME productivity a few months before the coronavirus pandemic. Back then I set out to answer three questions. First, I wanted to know what, to what extent did adopting digital technology, such as creating a website, advertising online, or in the case of our sponsors today is zero, using cloud-based accounting software, lead to improvements in productivity. Next, I wanted to assess the scale of the problem, comparing the UK to our closest trading partners in Europe, and seeing if the problems noted by uh, Bank of England Chief Economist Andy Haldane of a long tail of underperforming businesses that fail to adopt the best practices apply to the issue of digital adoption as it does to management and other issues. And then finally, if my suspicions about the first two questions, i.e. that digital adoption can lead to large productivity gains and there are a large number of SMEs who aren't adopting the right tech, then I wanted to understand why. Why, haven't, why aren't they taking these opportunities? Why haven't the low-hanging fruit been picked? So since I started the project, for many SMEs, we've seen a real digital revolution. We don't have phone calls anymore. We have Zooms. Digital technology has been a lifeline, and there are many cases of local businesses that have created websites, started selling online, or started using cloud and Slack and software like that to manage projects remotely. It reminds me a bit of a study that the economist Tim Harford writes about his book, Messy. So in 2014, there was a two-day tube strike. Like most tube strikes, it forced confused and stressed commuters to change up their route into work. But what's interesting is that economists who are studying the, the Oyster card data found that not everyone who changed up their commute went back to their old route. They found that about 1 in 20 people found this new route was better in some ways, be it quicker, cheaper, or just less crowded. Now, I hope in this case, it's more than 1 in 20 decide that some of the new digital tools they've adopted um, are going to stay with them, right? And I suspect they will, given the evidence on productivity that I'll talk about in a sec. It's a testament to the value of ex experimentation. I think the silver lining of this crisis is that more SMEs have been forced to run these experiments. 
Some businesses might discover they're better off selling online. Others might decide to give more workers the option of working from home when things return to normal. By the way, uh, we're currently working on a report on remote work and the evidence around that. So watch this space. Um, what are the benefits that SMEs will have seen through these experiments? So it's not the easiest question to answer because there's a real correlation or causation problem. So there are for, so the ONS find that a 1% increase in web sales is associated with a 0.2% increase in productivity. But it might just be the case that more efficient businesses tend to be the first to enter new markets and experiment with new tech. Well, there's some really interesting data from the Enterprise Research Centre's Micro Business Britain survey, which surveys uh, thousands of businesses that employ fewer than 10 people, found that businesses that adopt tech become more productive in the years that follow that adoption. They find that micro businesses who adopt cloud-based computing, for instance, are about 13.5% more productive a few years down the line. And they estimate that if the UK was able to double uh, micro business uptake of key digital tech, including things like customer relationship management software, web based accounting, and cloud computing, it'd lead to a £16 billion boost to GDP. To put that into context, almost one fifth of Brits work for micro businesses. So, uh, and if you divide £16 billion by the number of people who work, that, that amounts to about a £4,000 wage boost, equivalent to making up four fifths of the lost productivity that we've got since the financial crisis. This is achievable, by the way, because other countries do a lot better than us. For example, the rate of SMEs with very low levels of digital adoption in Finland is three times lower. So how do we close the digital gap? Well, my report looks at three key barriers that need to be overcome. Knowledge, finance and skills. In the spirit of experiments, I thought I'd focus on the first. Businesses are unaware of adopting a digital solution or cannot assess whether the solution will work, then they will underinvest in technology. In the absence of a pandemic forcing a business online, how do we get SMEs to try out these new forms of digital technology? And I think the key is how businesses learn from other businesses. So a Chinese study found that when SME managers regularly met and discussed problems, uh, they were more likely to adopt best practices a year later. Similarly, in Belgium, their Plato programme, which is a uh, a scheme funded by the government but run by a large SME membership organisation brings together SMEs to solve each other's problems and has been shown to lead to really significant productivity gains. So we should look at schemes like Plato and use them to get more businesses to overcome the knowledge barrier. The government's business basics fund, which is funding experiments into business networks supporting peer-to-peer -peer learning, is the right sort of initiative. But it's key what is shown to work is then scaled up. There are three lessons, I think, from, from looking at the successful schemes that are worth considering. First, peer-to-peer -peer learning should be attainable. Many SMEs won't trust lessons from, say, Rolls-Royce. SMEs who took part in the Northeast Growth Hub's high-performance program said it worked precisely because they felt they were learning from, from SMEs that were similar but just a bit further down the line. Second, it's really important to foster trust. So the reason the Plato scheme was so successful was it used intense face-to-face -face meetings. It was a residential weekend program. But that might be the challenge is finding a COVID safe way of doing that. But hopefully we'll be able to have more flexibility on this uh, in, a few, in a few more months. And third and finally, it's important to leave it to the experts. Businesses don't trust civil servants to give them advice on how to run their business. They fundamentally are only, want, only really trust other business owners. So where possible, government should outsource advice to trusted business groups, fund that with support. There's a huge opportunity to secure the recovery by increasing digital adoption. It's time we take it and learn from the insights of what's worked already. Thanks. Sam, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, can I just encourage our participants, um, our audience members, to uh, add your questions to the group chat? So if you're if you're not familiar, down at the bottom you should of your screen, you should be able to see a box that says chat. Uh, we're going to be looking through uh, the questions, and um, Philip Salter, the founder of the Entrepreneurs Network, will be fielding those questions after all the presentations. So if something comes to mind during one of our pitches, um, pop it into the group chat and, and we'll come back to you later. Um, Sam, thank you so much for kicking us off.
Uh, we're now going to go to Gary Turner, who is the co-founder and MD of Zero. So Gary, over to you. Thank you and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you this morning during an extraordinary time. Um, and this is a very important conversation that we should be having. Uh, I, I believe and we believe at Zero that we should launch a campaign to support the UK's 5.9 million small businesses bounce back after months of imposed lockdown. We need to get these firms active again, get them employing people and being productive where it's practical as Paul mentioned, to, to pivot to stronger and more resilient business models. Before going into the campaign, what the campaign should do and why it's important, um, if I could just frame who we are and, and why we care so deeply about this. So Zero represents more than 600,000 of the UK's smallest firms. Um, many thousands of accounting practices and firms across the country working together in a collaborative way on cloud technology, together with over 800 fintechs and other service providers in our app ecosystem. Uh, and to give you a sense of the scale of our platform, uh, we handle on a daily basis 1.2 million transactions worth about 1.4 billion pounds daily in the UK, which equates in broad terms, and we're not comparing apples with apples, but that's about 22% of the UK's GDP. So we've been seeing firsthand what has been happening in the small business economy. And, and that's informed five key elements to our pitch this morning. The first one is small firms are suffering and they need more help to survive. The impact of coronavirus is yet to play out in full, yet through the research work that we're able to do and looking at the activity and trading activity in our platform through a project we're calling Zero Small Business Insights, which is our snapshot of the health of the small business economy, we can see firsthand the effect that has been had on those small firms. We see that late payments have extended out by 7.8 days during lockdown. Employment is 6% down over the first three months and revenues are on average across the UK 28% down year on year with certain sectors such as hospitality suffering much more greatly than that. But coronavirus has also shown us that firms can put digital delivery at the core and will fare better in more circumstances when they do. Technology is a critical tool to help firms get and sell and operate online, to be ready for future disruptions, and build in that resilience and to adjust to changing customer patterns. We also need to accelerate this development to help small firms bounce back in our view. And we need a campaign to bounce back Britain. My second point is that we need to make it easier for firms to digitize and pivot their businesses back and, and help in that bounce back. One of the most uh, common uh, good news stories I've heard over the last few months, the achievements of so many small firms has been, have they been able to pivot their business models to operate differently online? Office workers have become home workers using cloud and other digital tools. Retail firms moved online to capture and serve the customers more effectively. And small firms are discovering new ways to digitally achieve greater value, scale and resilience for their business, often with very surprisingly positive results. So as the economy reopens and small firms look to rebuild, I believe that we must close the digital divide to help small firms bounce back more quickly. Hence, how can we encourage firms to make the most of the right technology? And that's a question that's more important than it has ever been. We also need to improve small business finance and small business financial literacy. It's not just about the lessons in this study, and it's not just about digital. So along, alongside helping firms adopt more digital ways of working, we need to improve the financial situation for many small firms. And that means tackling late payments and easing cash flow concerns, as our small business insights data also showed late payments are getting worse. And people have talked about this problem for decades, yet we have not fixed it. We must also make it easier for small firms to access the right finance. And many grown firms need long-term capital and not short-term credit. And we could start that journey by resetting the mandate of the British Business Bank to focus much more on long-term funding. Our fourth recommendation is that we must close the skills gap for small firms. To bounce back quickly, many more small firms will need to pivot their business models. And while some know how to do this, many will struggle. We believe that accountants are the key advisors for small firms and they can help provide the critical skills needed 
accountants can increasingly play the part of being the outsourced chief financial officer to the nation's community of small firms. And they will be pivotal, we believe, to increasing the financial literacy and the turnaround, and also help small firms adapt to the right uh, digital environment and adopt the right digital tools. And so we believe that we should do more to leverage relations between small firms and accountants, and we argue that strongly in this report. My final point is, is, is all about why we need to lo launch Bounce Back Britain. Given the urgency of these changes, we need to launch a new national campaign. Something like a Bounce, a Bounce Back Britain campaign should be led by a government minister with responsibility for that. We believe it should be spearheaded through a beefed up Small Business Commission or mandate. It should be guided by a working group of experts with practical experience in the small business economy. And we believe if we do that, then that we, should, we could see a huge generational shift immediately in, term, in terms of how businesses are moving to adopt digital tools. We need to make the best of a bad situation and accelerate this development. This campaign should bring together cutting edge technology and small business policy makers to hasten adoption of digital technology. And it should help educate small firms on what they need to do to become digitally savvy. We believe that if we do this, not only will it help the millions of small business firms across the UK, but it will also boost employment and restore growth. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Gary. And what, an, um, what a comprehensive uh, set of ideas. Um, Paul will be responding to the pitches um, after we finish all four pitches. So it'll be interesting to hear uh, what he has to say on, on that uh, fantastic set of measures. Right, we're gonna move swiftly on to Don Hallis, who is the executive um, director of Kodak. So Don, if you want to, uh, if you want to go now. Thanks, Katrina. So uh, as, as you very kindly said, so I'm the executive director of Kodak and at Kodak we're the lobby group for tech startups in the UK. Um, and so many of these tech startups uh, around the country are producing amazing products and services that aren't necessarily being adopted by local business communities and the links between these two communities and the products and services they're producing are, are minimized and we know that, that that sort of broader challenge of digital adoption which is the core of what we're talking about today is a huge part of, of the UK's productivity puzzle and and at Kodak we we've been thinking quite a lot about this for a long time and we wanted to look at what the tried and tested models to, to make this work are and the, the thing that's uh, very widely used in the tech startup community uh, is, is R&D tax credits. So we um, we did a ton of work on the R&D tax credit over the course of last year, actually, that has resulted in the government planning and consultation on the expansion of the credit to cover cloud services, to cover data sets. And actually, I know that Sam and the team at the Entrepreneurs Network have got some more recommendations about R&D tax credits in their report today. Um, but importantly, like what we found was that 69% of tech startups we surveyed said that uh, the R&D tax credits were a very important part of their, their uh, sort of cash flow and survival early stage. And I think that like that, that sort of sense of the, here's an added financial bonus is a, is a really important potential lever that government could, could use uh, in technology adoption, because we know that um, through the course of this crisis, you know, my grandma runs a, a leather bag shop in, in Leeds. And um, and I always say that you know she uh, she's very good at using Zoom now, but I'm not sure how good she is at using Spotify. Do you know what I mean? And uh, and I think like or or like or you know using Stripe or using you know Shopify or like and actually that there's a kind of deeper level. There's the there's a, the sort of top level of digital adoption, which everyone has become very effective at because they've had to. But actually, that more costly, more detailed, more more embedded level of digital adoption is the thing that we're going to have to focus on over the course of the next. 12 to 18 months and so so what could a what could a sort of tax credit for for, for tech adoption look like and uh, here there's sort of two models that we were looking at one is uh, something that's based in Singapore that Enterprise Singapore runs which is a very similar scheme is essentially a, a tax credit for technology adoption for productivity enhancing technologies but also combined with a scheme that the British government previously ran, actually, um, called the Energy Technology List, which was based out of the, um, the Carbon Trust and run under Bayes, and essentially provided enhanced capital allowances for industrial suppliers to buy products that were were sort of energy efficient, basically. And so we thought that if the you know if providers could prove that their technology solutions were uh, you know were boosting productivity and they genuinely you know, whether that's kind of Gary's accountancy software or 
you know, company that I spoke to last week called Flux that does e-receipts and, and paperless receipts. You know, those kind of products that clearly are like hugely beneficial to the people who are using them can prove that, then they would get on the list and they would be, you know, eligible for this tax credit. And we think that that's really important because the key part of why the R&D tax credit is so effectively taken up is because there's an ecosystem of people around that, um, you know, whether that's accountants, whether that's providers who help people fill in the forms, who incentivize the take up, right? So every year when you file your taxes, your accountant will say, hang on, there's a huge potential benefit here, uh, you know, that, that you're missing out on. And so just that constant like reminders are the things that are, that are super important. Um, so that's our broad idea, and we're looking forward to hearing more from, from everyone else. John, fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, thoughts there. Right, we're going to move swiftly on to Irene Graham. Um, Irene is the CEO of the Scale Up Institute. Um, Irene. Good morning, everyone, and great to see so many faces here today, including some very familiar ones. So it's good to see you all out there. Um, I suppose I'm going to put a bit of a lens towards this around the growth agenda. Um, we have been traditionally very good at startups, um, and we need to keep that and keep those policies in place that, that allow our businesses to start up. We are not so good at growing them. We're 13th in the world uh, at growing and scaling our businesses. Yet when we look at the SME community, and I know Jane picked this up, um, we, we often talk about SMEs, but they are very different and they, we need to really be tailoring any policy solutions to the growth journey of the company. Um, and our scale up community who are SMEs, just to be clear, they are the majority SMEs, there's 33,000 of them adding a trillion to the UK economy. Now our 5.7 million SMEs drive two trillion to the economy, so hugely important. 33,000 of those are driving a trillion of that. So we've got to make sure we're embracing those scale-ups and helping those on that journey of scaling up. Um, and touching on themes that have come up here today, what's the friction of, of, of growing? Well, there's access to talent, there's access to markets, there's getting the right finance, and there's building that leadership capacity. Um, through the crisis, we've uh, interviewed just in the last month over 500 of our scale-ups. They are proving to be very resilient. They are still uh, very innovative. They view themselves as ambitious risk takers and they are pivoting already in many respects um, their services into what um, the COVID crisis is, is bringing. Um, but they are worried about the economic uh, future. Um, and they are still wanting to do international services. So we need to remove the friction around some of the areas that are key in their growth. Um, and picking up some themes, therefore, what's important to them in removing that friction? Well, we've heard already about peer-to-peer -peer networks consistently every time we speak to scale-ups. They want access to local peer-to-peer -peer networks with businesses that are growing. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time in the last five years working with our local areas. I see Coast of Capital on today, Oxfordshire uh, and Thames Valley on. They're now driving peer-to-peer -peer forums for our scale-ups. They're working with the private sector, players like Vistage that have done this for decades. Um, and I think it's really important as we move forward with the government's peer-to-peer -peer offering that we're marrying up what we can do in the private sector with that government lens to make sure that we can expand what's available today and drive that forward. So very much endorse what um, Philip and the team and Sam have just said about peer to peer. The other friction of the course is um, getting access into, and they want more access to public relationships, the ability to collaborate with government. I think we've got a, a health tech business on here today. How do they do more? with collaboration in government and the procurement spend and with the corporate dynamic? How do we leverage up the ability to use the SBRI and Social Value Act to really drive more purchasing directly from these scale-ups and the innovation that can be driven across that? Um, and how does that mirror into as well how our universities and local educators can, can work with them further? So they're really important points as we see to drive forward that growth opportunity. We have a sort of broad 10 point plan for the government, but I think the one that we want to just touch on today is how you, we use data to really connect our scaling businesses in to the broad initiatives that government have, but the also broad initiatives 
that um, the private sector has. We've run with government based behavioural insights and the cabinet office and HMRC some really interesting pilots using the data that HMRC to have the most up to date data in really targeting and connecting businesses in to what's available. Um, so you can speed on the point about the R&D tax credit, getting them connected into that. We can connect them better into the export services and the finance services. And I think how we use data going forward, how government opens up and continues to target and segment the community of SMEs and reach into those. Embracing also the private sector is going to be very important because it removes friction and can get connection happening quickly and particularly as well mirrored with some of the local environment in terms of relationship managers will be important in, in those scale-ups being able to drive forward and connect into the various opportunities that exist. Um, Gary, I wasn't going to talk about finance today, but you've raised it. I think, you know, long-term patient capital is one of the big environments that um, the scale-up community needs. They need the follow-on funding. So dialing up what the British Business Bank does, delivering on patient capital are all going to be important um, and particularly dealing with some of the regional inequality. Uh, but opening up data can make a big difference. So that's the policy dynamic we'll leave with you today and embracing also the peer-to-peer -peer networks and what our local areas are doing already. Hi, Ray, and fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so guys, those are four uh, really interesting policy pitches. And what an opportunity uh, to be able to present them to Paul Scully, the small business minister. Paul, um, would you possibly share some thoughts, having now heard these four really interesting ideas? And then, um, and then guys, we're going to be coming on to Q&A. So if you have a burning question that you haven't popped in the chat yet, uh, pop it in now. And, uh, and we'll try to come to you after, uh, during the Q&A session, uh, which Philip Salter, the founder of the Entrepreneurs Network will be hosting. Paul, go ahead. Thanks very much. And yeah, there's been some fascinating uh, points raised there and many of which um, I'm, I'm onto and I really wanna work with you uh, to, to develop. I mean, Sam, you talked about digital take up and what we gotta be careful, I think what we were seeing from the Chancellor yesterday is it's part of this new reality that I was talking about, these behavior changes. Because you're absolutely right when you talked about the, uh, the, the strikes and people changing their commutes. We can see that now. I'm sitting in London, I'm also the Minister for London, so um, there's a lot of behaviour change that we're concerned about in London, about how to get people back on public transport. A lot of the offices aren't returning yet, some of them saying September, some January, some saying actually, you know, when the next lease break, they're going to uh, get rid of their HQ and have clusters uh, around the place. Now, that is going to have an ongoing impact on our high streets, on our local areas as well, in the West End, for example, and that will be replicated around the country, not just not just London focused, but cities and towns across the country. So we've got to get the balance right between um, uh, or, or, or that pivot. That's the, the sort of thing, that's the other bit of the thinking that I was saying that's been accelerated. Uh, not to stop business from doing that, clearly that's up to them, but, uh, but how those high streets can, can be modelled so that we've got a great quality of life in our local areas, as well as that quality of work and that quality of being out of strike businesses. But a lot of that will be those retailers and those hospitality um, uh, people in the hospitality sector taking up digital, working in different ways as well. So it's it, it's all really part of the sort of the same conversation. Um, I think to, to take the the SMEs further down the line, I absolutely agree. And you know, I know when I was running small businesses, uh, some of you have mentioned about um, you know the, the, the different site on the chat about different sizes of businesses. You know, we can we can concentrate on micros, we can concentrate on bigger, slightly bigger businesses, and those scale ups. But actually, what we need to do is concentrate on all of them in different ways. And as I said, we've got to make sure we can tailor support, tailor our, our, our conversations to each of them. But I've uh, come from a background of running very small businesses, starting off my kitchen table, etc. Et, et um, and I knew I didn't want to go to government. I didn't want to go to civil servants um, or, or politicians, particularly uh, for my uh, for, 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 for business thoughts. So I'm a bit of a poacher turned gamekeeper, I guess. Um, and it's extraordinary that when we've got um, this particular situation when um, we're having to, uh, rightly so, having to wrap our arms around the, company, uh, the, the economy and put a lot of money, a lot of resource from centralised 
uh, into uh, into businesses across the country that I still really long term adhere to the uh, the Ronnie Reagan uh, phrase as the nine most feared words of the English language is I'm here from the government I'm here to help I think it's just basically how can we step back and let you guys do it without with our support but going back to the um, to Sam's point about SMEs further down the line. People do like to speak to people that have been shared, that have had shared experiences. I think the roles and voices of this world do have a place in terms of particular parts of business support. It might be leadership. It might be uh, the big scale uh, digital transformation that you can uh, pick out pieces from. But again, we know that S- um, small business owners don't have that much time, so it's harder for them to pick that pick that out. So often it can be those peer to peer networks and those mentors that can take that Rolls Royce learning and bring it and pass it on to, to, to the smaller and micro businesses. I mean, Gary, you, you mentioned about the uh, uh, late payments, about the um, seven odd days of, of, of um, uh, longer um, uh, pay, payment scales that have happened within this schedule. And I think that's the, that just that example shows what the likes of zero, that sort of aggregated data can can benefit, can ha- can collate and benefit uh, government thinking and business thinking as well. But by, by just taking that anonymized data across your across your clients to see the whole picture, because uh, again, it's what businesses uh, can't always do is lift their head and see the whole picture, um, and and certainly governments. Um, we rely on you to, to so the, so the more you you guys can collect that and share that with us, that can really influence our thinking, which is why this sort of engagement at an early stage of this economic recovery is so important, rather than us just sitting here in Whitehall piecing together um, uh, something and say, okay, guys, what do you think? Let's all form it together. Let's let's have these conversations and get all this uh, stuff in. But that actually ties in with what Irene was saying about the about about data in general and how we can use data to to benefit um, uh, scale ups and SMEs. Um, there's but there were, there's two examples that I can uh, that I can give you. We've got the great database that uh, Liam Fox, when he was Secretary of State, set up, which is trying to encourage more businesses of any size, frankly, to export. We've got a trade deficit, and if we can just get if we can double the number of uh, you know, we forget free trade agreements and all that sort of stuff for a second. If we if we can double the number of, of tiny number of, um, in, of British businesses that export, so about six percent, I think it is at the moment, um, then we can wipe out our deficit by by that encouragement. So one of the initiatives was to set up um, a, a database, massive database, never been used before, done before, which looks at ten tenders, public and private tenders uh, across the world in many major markets. Um, and highlights of opportunities that are coming up as well, and so there's we're really trying to pivot the way we work here in um, in government to to cope with that. We really want to be looking as well at how we use smart data more. So we've seen um, a great example that Gary's business is based on smart banking, uh, open banking rather, which is um, uh, has been developed. Over, over the last few months and years, um, so that there's a rich amount of data and ease of use for so many apps, uh, which will allow us to uh, to be able to develop our businesses. And there are other areas that we can that we can grab hold of to do that um, as well. Um, Dom, I mean, you talk about tax credits. Um, now, clearly, yesterday's uh, mini budget and statement by the by the Chancellor was very much focused on uh, on job creation, job retention. Uh, there'll be a budget in the uh, in, in the normal time in the autumn, and I know we'll be looking at uh, you know the, the wider gamut of, of of business support in in, in what we do. So that's that, that was very very welcome as well. I should say for the people that are taking up more um, business that pivot to uh, moving from physical to digital delivery, the National Cyber Security Centre published guidance at the end of May because it's it's really important that businesses that are not used to uh, having te- technology, maybe it's uh, uh, was it Don's grandmother? Uh, I'm not sure we can. Uh, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of cyber security needed for the use of Spotify, but maybe some of the other uh, things that that guidance looks at um, the use of home working, video teleconferencing, and the ability to um, spot scams. So people that are new to it can feel more secure if they're going through that. I think I've um, just done a whistle stop tour around there, but I'm grateful for all of the points here. We know that uh, we build this; we've got to build this vision for government support for 
uh, greater use of technology, for greater use of um, peer-to-peer networks, mentoring, and support. If we're gonna if we're gonna bounce back together at every level, local uh, and national, small uh, local communities, local economies, and the national economy as a whole. Excellent. I've just seen something from Nigel talking about practical advice as well as encouragement for for, for exporting. That's that's absolutely true. That fits into the export uh, and practical advice that I was talking about. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. So thank you so much, um, Paul. Um, so yeah, my name is Philip Salter, and I'm here basically to kind of help um, coordinate the questions while Katrina kind of scurries around to try and get you on on video. So we've um, we'll start um, with uh, Simon Vicker, uh, and he's got a question around the uh, self-employed. So um, over to you. Uh, hello, Minister. Uh, you probably remember me from my Ipsy days, but I'm now working in something called Back in Business. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we're, we're trying to represent the voice of the small business and the self-employed and we're getting a lot of feedback from people in self-employment who seem to have fallen through the gap of the government's uh, SEISS scheme um, and it's backed up by some research that's been done by the Enterprise Research Centre which is showing that about one in five of the self-employed nearly a million people are just not eligible for the scheme and are falling through the cracks and it tends to be the more entrepreneurial type of person uh, quite often young people who have taken the risk and gone on their own uh, it's affecting mothers who are trying to return to the workforce but are doing it in a self-employed way and indeed people in their 50s and 60s who are maybe uh, leaving employment and becoming consultants and it seems that these people are being pretty devastated by, by uh, 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 what's happening in the economy and the fact that they've got no support. Um, and I'm just concerned that the government seems to be turning out, um, well, has a deaf ear, shall we say, to these people. And uh, I, I'd just like to hear some support for them and, and, and more more government uh, recognition of their value to the economy. Yeah. Um, so that's it, really. No, thanks, Simon. And it's something that I've uh, tried to work quite hard on because I, I was, I, I, as I say, I've been director of a company, paid myself through dividends, uh, not because I wanted to cut my tax bill, because uh, it barely does these days, uh, but it, uh, uh, but for, for ease of cash flow, actually, because I didn't want to set up a pay- payroll, but it was just me and my business partner. Uh, and set up the bureaucracy and, and and the other stuff around it until I needed to until I took on my first part so I could just take what I needed to pay the bills out of the company and then uh, and then move on from there really. Um, so I absolutely value that and I've been trying to work to 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 find a solution. But it's been difficult today. The reason being, I talked about wrapping our arms around the economy. What we try to do is put all of these um, schemes in place to help as many people as we could at any one given time at scale and at pace. So the grant scheme that we gave out was based on business rates. The uh, furlough scheme, the job retention scheme is based on payroll. The self-employment scheme is based on tax return. And unfortunately, the tax return isn't quite straightforward as uh, as it seems easy from the outside looking in. But we've had to reverse engineer really, really quickly these uh, these, um, systems to be able to deliver that money out. And because the tax return doesn't uh, differentiate between dividends from your own company, from other companies, whether it's investment income, whether it's, um, you know, in, in place of a salary, that's, that's, been, that's been hugely complicated. But I continue to, to you know, to be open for ideas. Uh, I think we're trying to, as I say, that the, the loan schemes are available, bounce back loans in particular. We're trying to get the economy open because long term, that's going to be the best way of doing it, making sure that we can actually trade once again. But I really do understand the problem, Simon, I'm, and I know there's a lot of uh, colleagues of mine in the, on the back benches that have formed the um, all-party parliamentary group uh, for, for, for these people as well. And, uh, you know, so the voice is being um, heard very, very clearly in government. Great. Thank you for, for that uh, question, question and answer. Um, so we'll go over to Matt Smith next. He's going to ask a question around data transparency, but I'd like to widen up the question as well as to Paul, but also to Gary and perhaps to Irene and others on the panel um, who have a, have some thoughts around the, the data that Zero has and maybe the data that other data that government um, could release. So Matt, over to you for your question from the Thanks, Philip. And, uh, good morning, Minister. Um, 
the Scale-Up Institute has done phenomenally well in recent years, uh, identifying and mapping scale-ups around the country and helping to a whole range of organizations target their support towards them. We now have a million companies that have taken bounce back loans. Uh, not only do they need to survive and grow, but they need to pay back 30 billion pounds worth of debt. Um, in the US, they have embraced open data and published an entire database of every company in the loan value that they've received in similar loans. Um, can we, in light of Michael Gove's recent speech, embrace the same level of transparency here? Do you want me to answer that? So in terms of, uh, well, look, in terms of the, uh, what we did with the British Business Bank, um, the British Business Bank, who obviously uh, who are overseeing this, are collating a lot of information from that. We've, we haven't asked them to publish it uh, as yet, all the, the regional data and other data, purely and simply because we want, we want them to be able to concentrate on actually getting the money out the door in the first place. But we are looking at ways that we can share more information. I mean, I'm happy to add to that as well. I think um, open banking is a rich source for us. I mean, that we did lead the way in that actually uh, supported by uh, the government and the US has replicated that. I think we need to leverage that more. Um, and I think there's opportunity to do that um, and also look at that across other of our um, sort of sectors. I think open energy is the next thing that's being looked at, open yeah. insurance. I think, how do we crowd that in? And I think that's really going to be important as part of the, the future digital strategy as well, um, I, I, overall with that. So I think there are opportunities to leverage in more. I don't know if Baroness Cromer's on the line this time. She also, man, they mandated for the banks to go to postcode lending data. Our alternative financiers should actually publish more data as well, I think, that allows us then to see what's making a difference. Some of the analysis we've done would say debt is not a driver of growth, but equity will be, but we can't get down to that local level as much as we'd like to. I, 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 I think we're probably long overdue a bit of a reimagining of the role of, I mean, companies' house is a pretty archaic function where minimal, literally pretty useless data is shared. And without increasing the burden on, on every business, the fact that we're now living in an increasingly cloud-based connected world must mean that there should be data should should be thrown off as a byproduct of just transacting. And um, but one of the one of the problems there is the fact that so many uh, of the SMB population are not embracing technology. And so many of them have been struggling to raise capital to get um, uh, bounce back loans and get, get support because when they then present themselves to a financial institution for lending, um, often with a shoebox or out of date records and information that it makes it very difficult for lenders to, to, to lend to them. So we think the data and improving and enriching data uh, from a capital point of view is very important. And, and we also take uh, our responsibility if we can in some way help benchmark uh, the kind of the productivity per sector, per region, per different sizes and different uh, different kinds of business, which is something that our, our platform can anonymously do, then we'd be obviously very happy to, to supply that. But I think that this next journey that we're embarking on, and I take Paul's point about, we shouldn't just be digitizing completely for the sake of it. We have to remember the role that the community plays and the role that people play. And we see digital as the core and, and, and people around the edge of that still being a persistent part of it. But I think in that new world, data, open data, open banking, the next level of co connecting those together must be, must be an important foundational part of that journey. Great. Um, so next question we're going to is a Giovanna Forte, and it's around um, procurement. Hello, can you hear me? You can. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Splendid. Um, I've got the video on as well. I didn't realize it wasn't on. Um, hello. Yes, we have an experience. We have a medical device that could potentially save the NHS um, upwards of 70 million on reducing unnecessary urine tests, which is the most common diagnostic process. Our problem is that a lot of the labs are privately commissioned by the NHS and they are paid per specimen. So when we go to them and say, we'll reduce retests, we'll reduce false positives, which means patients get diagnosed first time, their conditions don't become chronic. Uh, I was told a few years ago by one of them word for word, there is no way we would use or recommend use of your product because if you reduce testing to that degree will not half a million quid off our bottom line. And I said, well, what about the patients that the NHS is treating courtesy of your service? 
And she said, that's uh, their problem, not ours. Now, I've become aware since then that there's a lot of vested interest from big companies commissioned by the NHS. I've taken this up with Lord Pryor, with Ian Dodge and with Sam Roberts. And uh, I was told ultimately it's a contractual issue. There's nothing we can do about it. So if contracts are being set up to benefit those people providing the service and there is no nothing implicit in the contracts that will assist the NHS in its need to save money and improve patient care and deliver right first time diagnosis. How does one get around that? Because I know it's also it's something that, that will affect other industries as well, not just not just healthcare. So um, contracts, government, private providers need sorting out. Right. Um, Paul, Paul, did you want to answer that? Then I think the whole panel probably has. Yeah, I will, because I think that, you know, that's an extraordinary story. Um, and I'd love you to, um, if you've got time to take it up, um, you know, send, send, ping me a, an email or something. Uh, because, uh, you know, whether it's, it, it, I, I, I don't, you know, obviously NHS procurement specifically isn't my, my, my remit, but I'd love to be able to take out that wider thing, whether I can do anything with you directly is, is one thing, but certainly that just making sure that enough people, Matt Hancock, not least uh, understanding that particularly in terms of government procurement yeah we are trying to break through to make it make it easier for SMEs to uh, to to access um, uh, uh, government contracts government tendering we've tended to go uh, quite a lot through uh, bigger companies who then subcontract out but then obviously they take their piece out of it and tend to price small businesses out so that that that, that is changing whereas NHS procurement I think tends to work um, although it's a government procurement system it tends to work in a slightly different bubble um, and so I'd be really interested to, uh, to, to, to take you up on that. Great. I'll Thank put you. my email in the chat. Lovely. Can I just come in on that quickly? Like, I think, I think, yeah, I definitely think there's, there's, and actually it's one of the challenges of the crisis, right? Which is like, there's, there is a natural, um, flight to fairly small C conservative procurement practices in, in a crisis because basically there's a bunch of people you know, as, as civil servants, and it's the classic, you never, you never get fired for, for you know, contracting IBM. And, and, I, and I think, like, it, it's, it's really important that we don't lose, you know, lose the progress that has been made in the last kind of five years on the broader procurement policy. Like, I know that there's been a good ton of work done in understanding and more effectively putting small businesses and, you know, we work it, on it from a tech startup perspective, but the small businesses in general into government procurement and and like, how do we double down on that going forwards? The constant running sore of, I think, like a bunch of people, not only on this panel, but more broadly in this event, because it's, uh, it's consistently been a challenge. But, but it's important that apart from anything else, we don't lose the progress that we've already made because we go back to a more traditional model as a result of the desperate need to procure things very quickly. When actually what we've seen is, you know, those big businesses aren't necessarily best placed to pivot very quickly. Actually, a lot of the small businesses are the most effectively able to do that. And we've been pretty encouraged by, Actually, what we've seen in the NHS, to be fair, where like, you know, we, we had a bunch of businesses that were able to help with some of the core technology capabilities that the NHS needed and, and have, um, you know, have been pretty well engaged with. But ultimately, like that requires, you know, it requires a consistent approach that will continue that going forward. Maybe building on that, Dom, and bringing back the data point, I think um, actually if we could pinpoint some of the really interesting businesses like Giovanna's and then actually... Uh, send messages to them uh, to say this this tender is happening and get that more connected that would be a big thing and I think that can be done HMRC are already now uh, issuing certain letters to businesses and I think we should be able to do that to really pivot them to opportunities I think building on the points about SME procurement champions I think they really do need to be consistently given a job description that's fully about that and actually do more meet the buyer and more engagement around that. And I do think with the NHS, which has been very locally driven in terms of purchasing, so therefore quite, quite dispersed, um, one can't help but feel the SCA sandbox is something that could be developed further into the NHS, building on your point on what's happened with COVID and NHS. I think there's an opportunity to look at something different. Right. Um... Oh, we'll go over to um, Nigel Adams next um, from the University of Buckingham. Nigel, can I ask you to be very brief, and it also ties into a comment that I've just spotted um, that Gary's made around um, enabling young people, so connecting young people who have digital tax tech kind of savviness with, with kind of, um, I guess, kind of family business or older um, run businesses. So Nigel, if you could uh, keep your question brief so we can get through to another couple before the end. 
very quick. Um, main comment was that uh, SMEs generally are so busy that they don't have time to develop their, their digital activity. That's their biggest problem, I believe. And they perhaps should be using universities, colleges and others with students who are available and can actually do some of the work, obviously with guidance, um, even if it's done as part of a, of, a, of, a, of a free activity as part of their portfolio development. So I think it's something that should be done far more and it is available. You can also add to it, somebody commented about, about the 16 to 24 year olds who are, who are not working. There's, there's got to be a way of working it somehow, uh, even if they're not paid, I know that's not looked on well, but that many people would be pleased to get the experience and it would give the SME owners something different to look at. That's it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a number of universities do um, uh, some good initiatives themselves, but embedding that would be would, would be great. To, which does remind me of a, a wider point. It's, I suppose it opens up from what I said about uh, people SMEs working on their business uh, for the business on the bit on their business and reaching out for that support. Um, but there are difficult. There are there are also different types of businesses that someone has um, pointed out on the chat as well. Family-run businesses, medium-sized businesses, all with different challenges and. Initiatives like Be The Business, for example, can grab match people with those different, um, that, that different styles. So they're speaking to similar people and maybe also we can work through that to, to get that, the advice through growth hubs and Be The Business to link up with universities better. Cool. Sam, did you have uh, anything to add to this? Yeah, one of the things on time that's quite interesting is that I remember reading about a study that looked at a um, business support program in Finland and what they found, I think it was Finland, I'm, I, might, I might be wrong enough, but what they found was that businesses who just took the time to actually apply to the program, filled out this form which basically had to say, why, why are you looking to improve your productivity? What are the things that you see as potential problems in your business? They found that businesses that applied but were unsuccessful compared to very similar businesses, actually still ended up more productive. And one of the reasoning is that just taking that little bit of time out to actually do a sort of health check on your business can actually be quite valuable. And I think that might be part of the part of the value we talked about of sort of getting people like accountants to give more advice to business owners. Because if they sort of have that forward overview and can sort of see those problems, particularly if they're using digital technology that makes it a lot easier to track, then there's potential for spotting opportunities there. So I think that's, that's something on productivity that's quite important. Gary, you mentioned um, in the chat about getting kind of young, kind of tech savvy people connected into, uh, into kind of older businesses that could benefit from that. Have you got any ideas of how that could work in, in practice? Because I think it's, I think it's a, great idea that, that would, would, would be really valuable. Usually when you think of mentorship in business it's usually learning from somebody with more maturity or more longevity of experience but with digital uh, the, the mentors are unlikely to be 40 or 50 or 60 something entrepreneurs they're likely to be the people at the beginning of their uh, digital entrepreneurship journey and, and and I think given that we have a huge challenge in the not, not just because of lockdown but uh, unemployment among young people has been a, a, again a chronic problem yet they will have either the skills that they've acquired through uh, their, their education or are just inherently more digitally native and will be relatively cheap to employ uh, and if and if we can publicize that and if we can champion that I, I know that there will be millions of businesses across the country who if they could have a mentor come in and also work, work in their business, but be the person that manages their online Shopify account or, or organizes their online activities, then, then just a small change like that could make a huge impact. But I guess it's like everything else, it's about awareness and, and pu publicizing that and, and creating some scheme whereby we can channel the best, brightest young minds into the small business economy. Uh, and that, that just seems like, like hiding in plain sight is a huge opportunity. Excellent. We'll try and squeeze in one last question. So, um, Alison Bourne um, is going to ask the final question. Well, hello. It just actually tied in really well with what Gary was saying. Um, the idea of having a local hub for SMEs was a really good idea. And then why not create a local army of digital mentors to run the hub? Because 
there's so many shops that are empty and we could create something for local communities and local SMEs to go to. It could really spark off a revolution in the high street as well as supporting businesses and we can all learn from each other. I think it's a fantastic idea. Great, great, great question. I think Isabel Os Oswald will probably kill me if I don't mention the British Library at this point, so I've seen it in the chat. So um, it'd be good to kind of get your thoughts on, on that or other kind of hubs or other ways that we can we can connect. So, um, Paul, did you want to start? And yeah, then, we've got, um, so we've got 38 growth hubs around the country. And uh, my challenge that I've set myself is to make sure that the business advice and support, uh, and that will include digital, is consistent across those 38 growth hubs. Uh, we want to get you know level up to the to, to the top best practice uh, rather than just come up with some mediocrity. Uh, and so local initiatives are absolutely fine. If you say if you're doing a sort of high street digital hub, brilliant, absolutely go for it. Um, what we've got to make sure though is that people can can reach out and know that they're going to get the best quality. Uh, advice. If, if it's going to be government supported, um, then, then, then we just need to have that, that benchmark of quality, even if we're not delivering it ourselves. And great. Any um, other words from the other panellists? Or any, I guess it doesn't have to be an answer to that question, but we can just kind of quickly go I through. Mean, we just more broadly say there's three drivers to local growth as we see it and done some really analysis into deeply local what's driving the growth. It's access to the talent and the skills, and that's where the universities come in as well. And that it's clusters and it's access to regional equity. So I think the point about hubs and clusters and how we as create the ecosystem and learn from each other so that the good practice emerges in the local areas is very key. And we're seeing some really good examples of that. Um, and, and that's what we need to be really, really focus on in this next wave, the talent, the cluster, and the equity at a local level. Um, Dom, Sam, Gary, um, any final words? No, I mean, I was just gonna say, I think it's been a really interesting discussion, I think, you know, the, the kind of breadth and the, the width of what we're talking about, which is everything from, you know, local support to to sort of tax incentives to, uh, you know, the, the the kind of international examples reflect the, the breadth of the challenge. And, I you know, I, I think that um, we're going to see huge, huge uh, questions going forward more broadly. And so the more that we're able to, to take up this topic and see that you know, not just the uh, the existing businesses that need that digital boost, but actually the the new businesses that will hopefully be created, and we haven't spoken much about about that. But um, we'll 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 be able to drive the economy forward over the next twelve to eighteen months. Yeah, I, I would add that in the future employment's not going to come from big business. It's not going to come from government. It's going to come from the small business and small and medium sized business communities. Uh, and so it's so important that we connect those dots together. We've never had a, a, a time with such a proliferation of great technology that enable communities to cluster together. And so whilst the idea of having community support hubs is not a new one and goes all the way back to Business Lincoln before, I think in today's reality, there's an opportunity to create a, a, an incredibly strong and vibrant regional uh, network that is regionally delivered and, and, and relative to the context and the communities that are operating in but it's run off a, a set of best practice insights and quality control. Uh, and I think both government and the universities and colleges uh, have a big part to play there. And, 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 and I'm very encouraged by the prospect of building this new generation of local communities. Quick, quick point in response to Gary's young people idea. I, I, should, I meant to mention it at the time, but uh, in the report we actually know there is a, there was one project being funded by Nominet where they pay young people uh, who are out of work to um, do two days course and sort of things like Google AdWords, setting up a online store, and then pay for them to have placements with business with uh, SME. So there, there are initiatives already doing that. It seems like a really good, actually, idea from, from a business perspective in terms of you can essentially merge marketing with also playing a greater role as a sort of stakeholder in the community. Um, and then just to just to sum up, I think one of the things we should remember is how quickly these things can change. So um, there are lots of businesses that haven't adopted digital tech, but we've seen over the past few months just how many people can make those changes at very short notice. And if you look at more generally the use of things like cloud services, online advertising, uh, over a very short period of time, we've, we've gotten from essentially 0% to 
uh, in many cases, over 50% of businesses actually using it. So I think one of the things that makes this quite an interesting topic is that potentially it's quite a quick win as well. It's something that we can actually take the opportunity of in very short space of time. And I think given the sort of scale of the challenge, we should take any sort of quick win or any sort of uh, quick turnaround uh, that we can get.